church, welcome to our service today. I just want to invite you to sing and worship the Lord with us. Come on, let's sing. You have come. You have come. We have found life everlasting. Now our life to know your freedom never Your praise goes on and 
would welcome I was lost but he brought me and oh his love for me oh his love for me oh the sun sets free oh it's free A slave to sing Jesus died call us your children thank you that nothing can separate us from your love Lord we just stand before you we're just in your presence today Lord humbled to be here and thankful just ask you to come and move and come and speak to our hearts come and open our eyes Come and transform us into who you want us to be. We want to be renewed in your image. So Lord, we just 
give the next uh, 45 minutes or so, Lord, to you, Lord. Just capture our attention. Come and do what only you can do. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Everybody, please say amen. Well, hey guys, it's good to see you. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, Today we are continuing uh, this series called The Big Picture, which is about the mission and purpose of our church. But really, if you pull back, it's really about us learning how God wants us to live as a church and as individuals and how He wants to move us into the lives that He has envisioned for us. And uh, uh, last week was probably one of the most important messages that I have taught in a very long time. I feel like it's very important for our church, last week's message. So if you missed it by any chance, I would just ask you to go to LanierPoint.com slash messages and uh, look at it there. If you're part of this church, I want to make sure that everybody here uh, hears that message and understands it. And uh, the way this series is working is basically we're taking a little sentence uh, each week. And each of those sentences is just a three-week series, but each of those sentences is going to add up uh, to something I think is very important for us as a church moving forward. And last week's sentence was, uh, everyone's welcome. Everyone's welcome. And we spent a lot of time talking about how when Jesus came to earth, uh, he started this movement that he was starting. He started this church. And he said, I want you guys to understand from the very beginning that everybody's welcome. And he invited all these different types of people in in his life. And he went through a little bit of a teaching last week that we saw to remind us why that is important. And we learned so much about Matthew and tax collectors and all that kind of stuff. So again, if you didn't catch that, be sure to catch that uh, as soon as you can. Uh, Today we're kind of moving in that, it's kind of in a similar direction. Uh, There's some overlap in there, but it's a new idea at the same time that I think is really important for us. And today our little sentence is this, nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. We mean that in two ways. We mean that we're not perfect. People in our church, us, we're not perfect. And we also mean that we're not, we don't expect anybody else to be perfect either. That when people come into our church, people join our groups, people join our teams, and people become a part of our community, we don't expect them to be perfect. Now, I realize that I don't think there's anybody that's walking around saying, literally thinking, oh, I'm perfect. <laughs> I did one time. I preached a message, and there was I preached a message, and I said, "We've all messed up in life." And I had a guy come up to me afterwards and say, "I've never messed up." And I thought that guy, something's not right up there, right? I think anybody who's lived more than about a week and is self-aware at all knows that they're not perfect, right? But that's an old saying. The old saying is, "Nobody's perfect." And when you say that, uh, you're not saying. Uh, You know, there are people out there that think they're perfect, and I'm trying to correct them. That's not it. When we say nobody's perfect, what we're really saying is, you know, we've all got strengths and we've all got weaknesses. Uh, We've all got uh, flaws. We've all got things we struggle with. We've all got issues. We've all got baggage. We've all got this kind of thing. And that's what that's really saying. It's not trying to say, you know, there's all these people out there that think they're perfect. It's really just trying to say, you know what, we're all... We're all in the same boat here. We've got some strengths, we've got some strengths, but we've also uh, got some weaknesses as well. You know, nobody's perfect. And I'll tell you something, I, you know, as a pastor, uh, I'm, I'm aware of nobody's perfect. I'm really aware of that a good bit. <laughs> I'm aware of it in my own life. I'm aware of it, you know, uh, people in our church, people in the community. You know, if you pastor, you start to realize real quick, nobody's perfect. And it reminds me a little bit, it always reminds me, uh, you, you may remember, hopefully you will remember, uh, the uh, Christmas claymation special, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, right? And there is a, 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 there's a part in that where he goes and visits this island of misfit toys. And all the toys can kind of do something, but they're all kind of broken in some way too, right? And I think being a pastor is a lot like sort of being an administrator on the island of misfit toys. <laughs> And that's not to say that I think everybody in our church is more broken than people out in the community. I, I think we are a pretty good sample uh, of, of the community, and I think it's just the human condition. I'm actually I'm amazed by 
the staggering talents and strengths and abilities God has blessed our church with over and over and over again. At the same time, I think we'd all admit, well, you know, uh, we've all got strengths and we've all got weaknesses. And I think if we're really honest, we'd say, you know, a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times, my weaknesses you know, may outweigh my strengths. They may have more impact in my life than my strengths and that kind of thing. And that's really what we're uh, digging into uh, as we talk about this idea of nobody's perfect here today. Now, just like last week, I think it's very important. Last week I told you, hey, you know, here's the sentence, everybody's welcome. And that's, you know, we go, okay, yeah, we get that, but we've really got to drill down into that. We've really got to drill down so we can own it, we can, you know, grab it, really understand what God's trying to say about that, and bake it into our hearts and bake it into our church. It's the same thing uh, when we say, you know, nobody's perfect. When we say nobody's perfect, we can't just say, oh, yeah, 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 nobody's perfect, got that, check. What we got to do is we're going to say, um, why is, does God say that in the Bible? Why is that important to God? And what is Jesus really trying to get at when he underscores this idea to us that nobody's perfect? And that's what we're going to do here today. And just like last week, we're going to look at a story in the Bible. We're going to look at a story in the Bible that Jesus taught, and we're going to pull out the key takeaway points from that story that speak to us about how God wants us to be as a church and how God wants us to be as individuals. So Jesus taught this parable. And anytime Jesus is teaching a parable, that's not something that happened. It's just something that he makes up. He just makes up a story. That's a parable. And he makes up these stories to communicate a deep truth. And he wants us to get the truth so much that he gives us these very multi-layered stories so that they will resonate with us, so that we can really get them, so that we can really understand. And Jesus is teaching this story, so let's just jump in uh, to what it tells us about this story. It says this, it says, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. So first off, uh, we're, t we're getting a little metadata here. <laughs> we're getting what sparked Jesus to teach this. And it says Jesus taught this because he understood that there was a large group of people around that were very confident in their own righteousness, and they were kind of smug, and they thought they were a little bit better than other people, and they actually looked down on other people. And so Jesus is teaching this message for them. But he's also teaching the message for everybody that's there to hear it. And he's also teaching the message for you and for me because he knew uh, this was going to get written down. It was going to get preserved. It was going to be handed down to us. And so Jesus is teaching to three different groups of people. But the reason why he's teaching all those people this truth is because he loves them. He just absolutely loves them. And I want you to get this. A lot of times people would come up to Jesus, Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, um, teachers of the law, and they would come up to Jesus and they would try to trap him or trick him or embarrass him or something like that, you know, and they never would. And Jesus would respond to them. But we read that and we say, oh, he's rebuking them. Like Jesus is putting this sick burn <laughs> on these guys. And sometimes, you know, I guess it, maybe it was a burn, but I don't think that was the heart of Christ. Jesus loves um, these smug people just as much as he loves anybody else. We learned last week that Jesus loves everybody. And he loves them so much that he wants to help them. He wants them to understand. He wants them to see. He wants them to get what's going on. And these people are so smug, they're kind of deceived. They, they think they're in a better place than they are, you know. And, and they think that they're, uh, you know, doing so much better than they are. And Jesus says, boy, you know, that's bad because they can't, grow, they can't learn, they can't get better, they're self-deceived. So somebody's got to come because they love them and help them. If Jesus didn't love them, he wouldn't have to respond to them at all. So the whole reason Jesus is teaching this is because he loves those smug people, and he loves all the other people that were there, and he loves us. And he wants all of us to understand this very deep truth. So he goes into this story, and the story starts like this. He says, there's this tax collector, right? And there's, uh, a, a, well, uh, there's this Pharisee, first he mentions, and then he says, and then there's this tax collector. And he says, and they both are going to the temple to pray. Now, for us to get the full impact of this story, we've got to understand what the people that were standing around, how they heard this story. Because Jesus was, uh, 
He was crafting this story to, uh, to impact them, and he's hoping that we'll get it too, but he's really crafting it in a way so it would really impact them. And so he starts this story off. And he says, uh, he says, first of all, there's this Pharisee, right? And this Pharisee's going up to the temple to pray. And everybody in the crowd's thinking, okay, that makes sense. Pharisees, very holy. They, they're all about holiness. They're all about doing, you know, they, they do all these rituals and all these things. And they often go to the temple. They often go to pray. Okay, so we've got this Pharisee, and he's going to the temple to pray. And everybody in their brain's thinking, okay, I get it. That's the hero of the story. That's got to be the hero of the story. I have a rabbi teaching a story about God and, and our relationship with God, and he's telling me that this very religious person is going up to the temple to pray, and they're pretty sure, pretty confident that that's got to be the hero of the story. And then Jesus says, but also, not only is there's, there's this Pharisee, he says, but there's a tax collector. And the tax collector is also going to pray, and he's also going up to the temple to pray. Now, this is the thing to the crowd that was listening to Jesus that was most puzzling, that, that, that was kind of crazy talk. Because as we learned last week, everybody hated tax collectors. Everybody hated them. And they all thought that tax collectors were as far away from God as you can possibly be, and, and they've, they've moved that way intentionally. They're not interested in the things of God. They're interested in themselves and in lining their own pockets. They don't care about God or God's people or God's nation or anybody else other than themselves. So they're as far away as they can get, right? And they're way over there. And, and you, don't, you wouldn't talk about a, a tax collector praying. Why would a tax collector pray? What would he pray about? Why would he be praying? So that is crazy talk to them. But what's even crazier to them is that he's going to the temple to pray. Everybody hates this guy. Everybody despises tax collectors. Everybody avoids them. Nobody wants to see them up at the temple. Nobody wants them there. They're not welcome there. So yeah, maybe this tax collector, maybe he decides he wants to pray one day, but why in the world would he head to the temple to do it? And so when the people are hearing this story, Jesus already has them hooked. He's, he's got them on this thing. And in a weird way, it almost sounds like he's setting up a joke. <laughs> you know, Pharisee and the tax collector are on the way to the temple, you know. But he's setting this story up so that they will get this sense. Okay, we've got this really religious guy that's hitting all the marks and has dedicated himself to, to doing all the right things. And we've got another guy over here that doesn't care about anybody or anything and has never done the right thing. But they both decide to go to the temple, and they both decide to pray. Everybody's kind of got that in their heads. And then Jesus continues the story, and he says this. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. So first off, we've got the Pharisee, and the Bible tells us that the Pharisee, he goes and he stands off by himself. And the reason why he stands by himself is he's practicing a very early form of social distancing. <laughs> he really is, because Pharisees didn't want to touch anybody or talk to anybody or interact with anything that would contaminate them. They, were, they thought they were ritually clean and ritually pure, and they spent their, a lot of their existence trying to keep away from things that might uh, pollute them, that might taint them, that might infect them. And so if this man's going to go and pray at the temple, he's not going to pray near the commoners. He's not going to pray near uh, uh, any, you know, the, he's not going to pray near a Gentile. He's not going to pray near a woman. He's not going to pray near a tax collector. He's not going to pray near anybody. He's got to be off by himself because he's so holy. He's just so holy. He cannot be near anybody because he does not want to get infected with their whatever they're bringing to the party. And that's why he's over there doing that. He's establishing social distancing, not just physically, but emotionally, mentally, spiritually. I'm distant from all these people. I can't be around all this riffraff because I'm trying to keep myself holy and right. And then he goes on and he thanks God that he's not as bad as all these other people. What you need to know back then, it was very common for people to go and go to the temple and pray, but they would, they would go to their temple and pray out loud. 
So, uh, and they would pray some prayers. There are record, recorded prayers where they would say, God, I thank, you that, I thank you that I wasn't born a Gentile or a dog. Things like that. And so they would get up there and have these kind of, what we would read as very boastful prayers out loud because they thought praying out loud was even holier. It made them even more holy and, and you know, off the hook, <laughs> close to God. And so he's feeling really good about himself. He's feeling so, he's like, God, I'm just, I thank you that, that, that I'm not like these evildoers and I'm not like a thief and I'm not like people that commit adultery. And I thank you most of all that I'm not like this tax collector. I don't know if he's saying it out loud or if he's saying it in his head, but he's surely calling out the tax collector. And he says, I thank you, God, that I'm better. Let's just call it what it is, that I'm better than these other people. I'm doing better. Thank you for that. And he's feeling very smug about it. And you wonder, well, what makes him feel like he's doing so much better than everybody else? Why does he think that in the presence of God he could stand there and say, God, I thank you that I'm better than all these other people? And he tells us. Jesus breaks it down in the story for us. He goes, I'm better because uh, one... I fast twice a week. I fast twice a week. Jews in that day were required to only fast one day a year. The Day of Atonement, God asked the Jews to fast on the Day of Atonement. Beyond that, it was all voluntary. And he's like, hey guys, uh, the rest of you are fasting one day a year, maybe here and there. I'm fasting 104 times a, a year. And 103 of those are extra credit fasting days. Not even required. But I am nailing it. That's just who I am. So he's feeling pretty good about that. And then he says the other thing that makes him sure that he's better than everybody else is that he tithes. <laughs> he says, I give a tenth of everything I have to God. I'm, I'm a tither. That was a big deal. Uh, tithing is mentioned in the Old Testament, commanded in the Old Testament. It's taught in the New Testament as well. Tithing is giving 10% to God. The Jews, however, uh, they took that command from God and over the years, they started coming up with uh, questions and different things that they wanted to do. Uh, and, and the rabbis would debate, uh, should we tithe off stuff that farmers have already tithed? If a farmer raises a crop and he already tithes off of that, do we need to tithe it? And so they came up with this very elaborate, God had a very simple thing, 10% comes to me. They came up with this very elaborate thing that looked like a tax code to you and me, with all these different deductions and things you could do and all this stuff and blah, 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 blah. And what he's saying is, God, I didn't take a single deduction. I, t- I tie 10%. A lot of these people won't do that. I do that. I tie 10%. You can, you, they can wheel out my tithe record, and I'm not embarrassed about it at all. I, 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 you know, I, I, I did the whole thing. I didn't take a single deduction <laughs> tithe deduction, and so therefore, given the fact that I'm fasting like crazy, and I'm giving, I'm fasting more than anybody around here, and I'm giving more than anybody around here, I mean, I don't have to say it, but clearly, clearly, I'm a Pharisee, clearly, I'm doing better than everybody around here. That's what he's thinking. And he focuses on those two things as sort of his standard. He creates his own standard. His standard of whether I'm doing right or not, whether I'm hitting it out of the park or not is, am I fasting and am I tithing? And if I'm doing those two things, then I'm better than most people because they're not doing it, therefore, I'm great. And therein is the problem. Therein is the huge problem. That's the thing that humans like to do. We like to focus on a handful of things that we know that we're doing or we think that we're doing better than other people. We ignore everything else. We focus on those things. We create some weird standard for ourselves. And we say, okay, I'm passing. Or I'm exceeding. And we start to feel smug. He doesn't feel like uh, he's doing, you know, he's closer to God because he has a heart filled with love for God and a heart filled with love for other people, and he's growing in his relationship with God. He's boiled it down to, well, I'm, I'm skipping a bunch of meals and I'm giving some money, therefore, 
and I don't see anybody else doing it like I'm doing it, therefore I'm great. And the truth is, when you create your own standards, you can cut it in such a way that you always win. You know, I could tell you I'm the smartest, best-looking, and best-speaking 54-year-old bald guy with a beard that lives in Flowery Branch that keeps bees, and I'd be right. Because I put so many caveats on it and created my own standard, I can make myself look pretty good. And that's what this guy's doing. He doesn't talk about loving his heart for other people or loving his heart for God or helping the poor or assisting anybody or serving anybody or none of that. All he's talking about is I've, I've, I'm pretty good at two things. I'm going to focus in on those. And I'm going to look down on others who aren't as good at the two things that I'm doing. He's created his own standard, and we're warned against that in 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, it says this. It's a very interesting verse. It says this. I'm talking about people like this. It says, They compare themselves to one another and make up their own standards to measure themselves by, and then they judge themselves by their own standards. What self-delusion. <laughs> This verse says when you start creating your own standards, then you, 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 you start conning yourself. You start conning yourself. You, you're, you're delusional in your own mind. You're not, you're not aware of what's really going on. You're not really aware of the facts. You're, just, you're in some kind of weird place. And you can start to get prideful. And you can start to get smug. And you can start to get a little cocky because you think you're doing something more than other people are doing. And this infects... Uh, everybody infects uh, all human beings. It's something that we kind of do, and God's warning us about that. So the next verse is really the truth of the matter, and it might sting a bit, but won't you look at it with me? It says this. It says, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. First of all, this verse says everybody sinned. Does that include me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Does it include you? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody. Everybody. And then he says this. He says, all have fallen short of God's glorious standard. See, God's got this standard. And God's standard, as much as this might seem unrealistic to you and to me, is sort of perfection. The standard is that we would, at all times, in all ways, in all places, think like Jesus, act like Jesus, respond like Jesus, love like Jesus, be devoted like Jesus, persist like Jesus, care like Jesus, serve like Jesus. That's it. That's the standard. And the Bible says, very bluntly, none of us are hitting that standard. Nobody. You could be the king of the Pharisees. You could fast 103 more times than anybody else in the year. You could give more than anybody else. But we're not hitting that standard. And the reason why that's really important for us to understand is sort of the next big takeaway here, and this is the next big takeaway. God doesn't grade on a curve. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many times I've talked to people over the years. This goes way back to my days in Athens, talking to young people up until, you know, today. And you start talking to people, and they start sort of telling you in a weird way why they're good people. You know, I'm not the best person, but I'm, I'm a good person. And it sort of gets into this idea of like, well, why should God you know, let you into heaven. Why should God accept you? I was like, well, I'm not. I'm not as bad as, you know, I'm, I'm a good person. I'm not as bad as... So, so, so you're telling me that the reason why you're feeling really good about yourself is you're not as bad as the worst person you can think of? What you're really telling me is you think God grades on a curve. That God looks down on society... He goes, oh man, they've all messed up, but there's this 10% here. There's this 10% here who are lying and cheating and thieving. 
They're not acting like I'd want them to act, but that's all I got. God says, my standards don't swing based upon how the people in the world move or operate. My standards are firm. And for you and I, we're going to see this in a little bit, but for you and I to really receive the grace of God, we have to get to the place where we understand how bad we need it. Not rubbing your face in it, but we certainly can't allow ourselves to get a little cocky. Because I've got to tell you something. This smugness and this cockiness, it infects all human beings, but it really infects people that are religious. They think, well, you know, I'm not perfect, but, but I go to church, and I serve, and I own a Bible, and I do this, and we start thinking, you know, what? Well, I'm kind of, kind of, you know, there's all them, and then there's, I'm, I'm way over there. And they miss the whole point. They miss the whole point. They're getting smug and they're getting cocky. And Jesus says, we can't do that. We can't do that. So let's see what the tax collector does. Jesus continues the story and the tax collector has a little bit of a different approach. He says this, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. So the Pharisee stood off by himself and the tax collector stood off by himself as well. But the reason the tax collector stood off by himself was very different. He didn't stand off by himself because he was worried about being contaminated by anybody. He stood off by himself because he said, I have no business being here. I have no business being at the place where people meet with God. And if God isn't incredibly gracious to me, I'm going to be in real trouble. I cannot tell you how many times in my life I've talked to people about coming to church. This is even before I was pastoring. I invited them to come to whatever church I was going to. And I'd get something like this. Oh, man. <laughs> the roof would fall in if I walked into a church. The pillars would fall off the front. Lightning would strike the building. And what they were saying is what this tax collector was saying. I got no business being at a church. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that later. <laughs> Jesus also says that he won't even look up. He won't look up. When you're ashamed, when you feel guilty, when you're embarrassed, it's a human thing that we don't want to make eye contact with people. We just we look down, we look away. If we've hurt somebody or wronged somebody, it's even more difficult. This is very deeply wired in us. It's even wired into dogs. I don't know if you've noticed if you've got a dog. My dog will look me bold in the face about anything, but if I start telling him no or he's done wrong, he just has to look all around. He won't, <laughs> he won't look me in the eye. He's ashamed. That's what's going on with the tax collector. He's, uh, back then they would pray looking up with their hands and they'd pray out loud. And he's like, I can't look up. I can't, I can't look up. I can't look up. And it tells us he beats his breast, you know. Beats his breast. This was a sign of extreme sorrow. And it was considered sort of humiliating to do it. So much so that most men back in the era were too prideful to do it. It was kind of seen as a thing that women did, but not men. Uh, a man didn't want to look unmanly, so he wouldn't do that. But this guy, this God, I just... I don't know what to say. And then he utters this prayer. Very different prayer than the Pharisee's prayer. He says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And what he's doing here is he's... Um, he 
he's having this huge, big, bold moment of humility. Of just humility. He is humbling himself before God. I've told you time and time again that we don't understand humility. The word humble isn't used in our world except to mean bad or weak. But humility just means owning your strengths and owning your weaknesses. And ultimately, I think the best way to kind of put it in modern language is it means being real and authentic. And and maybe the phrase we could use, the best way to translate humble into modern talk would be this, keeping it real. Keeping it real. To be humble means to keep it real. Admitting you're not perfect, admitting when you've blown it, being real and authentic and honest. And that's what this man's doing. He may not be the holiest guy in the world. He may not understand all the rituals. He may not have ever tithed a dime. He may have never fasted. But he knows how to be humble. He knows how to keep it real. And that's what he's doing at the temple. You know, right now we're being asked to wear masks, and face coverings everywhere we go. And I don't want, I, some, of, some people think that's a political thing. I, I don't want to get into any of that. But I think we can all agree on this about wearing masks. It's not fun. <laughs> I don't like wearing a mask. Although I must tell you that when I put masks on, people really like that. And they keep stressing to me that I might need to do that permanently and make very big ones. Like very big masks, just eye holes, that kind of thing. They really like that, you know. But, man, I've been dutifully wearing my mask everywhere I go. You know, every time I go in, wearing a mask, wearing a mask, you know. Every time I get back to the car, I am so happy and relieved to take that mask off because it's just, it's burdensome and it's hot and I just, I just, I get tired of wearing it. It's just, it fatigues me to wear it. I don't like wearing it, you know. And um, that's just a physical mask. Let me tell you what's even more burdensome and wearying and fatiguing. Trying to keep up some kind of fake persona, relationally, emotionally, spiritually, not being real. And trying to keep that up. Man, that'll wear you out. Absolutely wear you out. It's a much bigger burden. But this guy, he's not doing that. He's just taking all the masks off. He's not trying to pretend. He's not saying, I'm the best of all the tax collectors. I'm the nicest one or any. None of that. He just says, God, please have mercy on me because I'm a sinner. And effectively, what he's saying is this. God, if you don't have mercy on me, if you don't have mercy on me, There's just no hope. So I need that from you. And whether the tax collector knows it or not, he's modeling something for us that lines up with this huge idea, this huge theme in the Bible. Look at the next verse. It says this. We are all infected with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. First of all, the Bible says, you know, I told you the Pharisee's trying to stick, he didn't want to be infected by all the sinners around him, but the Bible's got bad news for all of us. The Bible says we were born infected with sin. We're carriers. We've got it. It's the human condition. It's who we are. We're born with it. And it also says this, interestingly, it says, when we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. You know, Adam and Eve were in the garden. Everything was perfect. Great relationship with God. Everything perfect. They had one rule. They weren't supposed to break the one rule. They broke the one rule and the full weight of sin and distance from God, separation from God, uh, shame for what they've done, regret. All these things were brand new. Nobody had ever experienced shame, regret, guilt, uh, you know, any of that kind of stuff. Separation from God that had never been experienced before. And it all hits them. And the Bible says that they, they hide from God. It says they realize they're naked. And a lot of times when people read that, they think, oh, they're, they're, they, don't, they realize they don't have clothes on, and now they're, they're embarrassed. But I think it, it's speaking so much more about 
their, more than just their physical condition. That suddenly they were, the shame and the guilt and the remorse was evident. And they knew it. And they felt naked. And the Bible says they grabbed fig leaves and they stitched them together to try to make clothing. But again, I don't think it was just them kind of covering up their bits and pieces. <laughs> I think it's just intuitive that when you're broken or you've done something bad or you failed, you just want to hide. And not only do you want to hide, but you want to kind of cobble together some, some, some kind of covering. And that's what they were doing. And humans have been doing that ever since. We all know we've blown it. We all know we made mistakes. We all know we're not where we need to be. We all get that. I don't know of a single person alive that doesn't understand that. So what we try to do is we try to cobble together our own righteousness. Not God's righteousness given to us, but we try to come up with our own system, our own thing that makes us feel better about ourselves and says, say, yeah, I'm, I'm righteous. See, look at me. Look at what I can do. See what I'm going to do. And God says, don't you get it that anything you cobble together is just filthy rags? It doesn't amount to much. And you've got to understand that. In fact, I would say to you that I think the Bible says that it's kind of foolish to go down that road. To try to put together some kind of righteousness that's from you and of you. That it's just going to tank. It's just going to go south. It's never going to really get anywhere. It's, it can't get you where you need to go. If we could do that without Jesus, Jesus wouldn't have come. But we can't. It's like building a tower to the moon or building a tower to the sun. Good luck on that, Good luck on that task. I don't think you're going to be able to do it. It's that kind of thing. And so he says, listen, you need to understand that, not to feel overly guilty. You just need to understand the human situation, and you need to understand that so that you can be humble. And remind yourself to be humble and not get in a place where you feel cocky and arrogant and all these other things. And that brings us to the next big takeaway here, if you'll write this down. It says, we should be people who are always striving to keep it real. <laughs> always striving to keep it real. We should strive to be a real God, uh, real with God, real with ourselves, and real with others. That should be our goal. Now, it's critically important that we see how Jesus sums this up. How Jesus sums this up, he sums up the story, is so important because right now the story doesn't, is not very happy. No, no, it's very happy. But we get to this part where Jesus actually has this shocking ending to the story that blew the minds of the people that were hearing him when he taught it. And it goes like this. He says, I tell you that this man, he's talking about the tax collector. He says, I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, the Pharisee, went home justified before God. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And again, this blew their minds. They're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're telling me the tax collector is the hero of the story? You're telling me the tax collector, his prayers got heard instead of... The Pharisees' prayers? You're telling me that the tax collector is justified by God at the end of the day and not the Pharisee? What is going on? The word there, justified, is very important. He says he's justified. Now, justified doesn't mean he's perfect. doesn't mean he's fixed. doesn't mean any of that. But here's what it does mean. It means you're in right standing with God. What God is saying is, I heard this man's prayers. And I gave him my grace, and I gave him my mercy, and I gave him my forgiveness. And now he's in the right place with me. God says, I'm going to start working this man's life. This is the type of person I can help. I can't help this guy because he doesn't think he needs any. This guy thinks he's so awesome, he doesn't even know how bad off he is. It's horrible to be failing, but it's worse to be failing and not know you're failing. This guy doesn't know he's failing. He's sitting here talking smack about everybody else 
to me, thinking that's a holy prayer. I, don't, I, don't, I can't help somebody like that. All I can do is help them to start to really see. And maybe, the, maybe they'll humble themselves. And if they'll humble themselves, then I can move in their lives. Because when you humble yourself, you open yourself up to all God's grace and all God's mercy and all God's wisdom and all God's insight and all God's power. But the Bible says that if we are prideful, the Bible says God resists the proud. Like, there's nothing I can do for that somebody like that. So let's just quickly do an, a righteousness audit so you understand what's going on here. You help me. You help me. You keep score, okay? <laughs> righteousness audit. All right, all right. Who do you think read the Bible more regularly, the Pharisee or the tax collector? Let me know. Who do you think? We're going to give that one to the Pharisee. Who do you think prayed more often, the Pharisee or the tax collector? I guarantee it was the Pharisee. They had all kinds of prayer systems and routines and all stuff going on. Who do you think knew biblical doctrine better, the Pharisee or the tax collector? Well, the Pharisee, of course. The Pharisee. I don't know. The tax collector knows any Bible doctrine. The Pharisee knows all of that. Who had a better spiritual reputation among the devout, among the religious people? The Pharisee, by far. None of them, none of them thought this guy had anything to bring to the table. If you asked both of them, which of you two guys loves God more? The Pharisee would say, I think I do. And the, and the tax collector would say, probably the Pharisee. So right now the Pharisee, is, he's sweeping our little, our little audit here. He is the guy, man. He's, he's racking up all the points. He's getting it done. Last question, though. Last question, though. Who do you think was more aware of their desperate need for God? Oh. The tax collector. This is the one area in which he excels way beyond the Pharisee. He just knows. <laughs> he just knows he needs God. He just knows. He's like, God, left to my own devices, things do not go well. Going down my own path, my own way, never works like it should. I hurt myself and I hurt others. I could sit here and talk to you about all the ways I'm better than so-and-so and all the ways I'm better than so-and-so, but at the end of the day, here's what I know. I am broken. I'm a broken man that's done a lot of things I regret. And I need mercy from you. And Jesus says, that guy understands how much he needs me. He's desperate for me. He really understands what's going on. I can work in the life of somebody like that. Now, I need to kind of do a timeout here and explain something to you because it sounds like what I'm saying is don't do the right thing. Don't do good things. Don't do things that God would ask you to do. Just do whatever you want to do, but be humble about it. <laughs> That's not what I'm suggesting to you at all. Here's what I'm saying. Do the right things. But don't think your righteousness comes from doing the right things. Here's the difference. This guy over here, the Pharisee, thinks he's going to get into heaven because he's doing all these things and he's cobbling together his own righteousness and it will never work. He can't maintain it. It won't work. This guy says, there's no way for me to get in. There's no way for me to even be in the presence of God unless God moves by His grace in my life. And God takes the righteousness of Christ. Jesus died on the cross to purchase righteousness for you and for me. And He gives it to Him. That's the difference between us trying to build our own righteousness and us receiving the righteousness of Jesus in our lives. And He receives grace, and He receives mercy, and He receives forgiveness, and He receives everything that God wants to give in His life. And this poor guy over here is still trying to build something. I don't know what. Just trying to build something that's going to impress God, impress people. I don't know what. But this guy gets it. And here's what happens. 
when that love and that power and that righteousness starts to pour into your life, undeserved, absolutely undeserved, it just comes out of the grace and the mercy of God, well, what should happen is your heart should respond and say, you know what, I, I want to love God more because He's loved me so much. And I want to love other people more because God has loved me so much. And I want to be more forgiving because God has been so forgiving to me. And I want to serve and I want to give and I, I want to do all these things because God has been so good to me. And it's not about trying to earn God's love or build some kind of righteousness of our own. It's just, it's just a heart, a broken heart that's responding to the amazing, perfect love and grace of God. And that's how it works. But if at any point we look back and say, man, look at all the great stuff I'm doing for God. He sure owes me one. We've missed it. We've completely missed it. Look at what the book of Hebrews says. I love it. Talking about Jesus and His grace to us. It says this. It says, For our high priest is able to understand our weaknesses. When he lived on earth, he was tempted in every way that we are, but he did not sin. Let us then feel very sure that we can come before God's throne where there is what? Where there is grace. There we can receive mercy and grace to help us when we need it. <laughs> Do you know what the throne of God is made on and built on and what they call it? They call it the throne of grace. And the Bible says Jesus completely understands that we're broken. And He completely understands that we're struggling. And He completely understands what it is to be tempted to do wrong things. Although He never did anything wrong. But He completely sympathizes with our plight. And He loves us so much that He died on a cross for us. And He goes to heaven and the Bible says in heaven, He's constantly interceding to the Father on behalf of us. Like, Lord, you've got to forgive that guy. He, you don't, he, he's struggling. He doesn't understand. He, he's never been loved like He ought to be loved or, or whatever. He's interceding on our behalf. And the Bible says we can be sure and confident and walk straight into that throne room and receive grace and mercy from the throne of grace, from the King of grace Himself. And we will be justified in the sight of God. Not because of us, but because of Him. That brings us to this last takeaway. This is this. We all, we all come to God solely through His grace. So what does this mean for us as a church? Well, we've got to decide something is the church, and we got to own it. we got to decide this. We're not trying to be a perfect church filled with perfect people. We're not trying to look like a perfect church filled with perfect people. We're not trying to be some successful church where everybody looks successful. That's not who we are. Instead, we say this. We say we're a group of imperfect people accepting others' imperfections as well as our own as we are helped along the way by a loving and gracious and perfect God. That's a very different thing. I've got to tell you, churches that try to look polished and expect everybody in the church to look and act polished, drift. They drift way off. They get into weirdness. We've got to decide we're not going to be that. You got to remember the turning point of this whole story. I hope you remember. The turning point is when the tax collector, who by everybody's standards in the story is a loser and a misfit and the bad guy, he says in his heart, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And what he's really saying is, God, I've been following my way my whole life long, and my way is no good, and I surrender, and I follow your way. And I want us to be a church, and I'm sure God wants us to be a church that's absolutely filled with people like that who just say, man, I'm a sinner, and I'm living on the grace of God. Where everybody here says, you know what? It is level ground at the foot of the cross. We are all the same at the foot of the cross. We all have the same prayer as that tax collector at the foot of the cross, and that is this. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, you've got to help me. If I'm left to my own devices, my heart will grow cold. Or I'll chase dumb things. Or I'll do wicked things. Or I'll say things I shouldn't say. God, I've got to have you in my life. I've got to have your forgiveness and your grace and your power. And I am here. God, have mercy on me, 
a sinner. That's the goal. To be a church, not only where everybody's welcome, but that we totally understand nobody's perfect. And you can still come on in. Will you bow your heads with me for prayer? Father, we thank you for your astounding grace. And Lord, we acknowledge that nobody comes to you except through your grace. We don't earn our way to you. We can't barge our way into your presence. We can't look and say, well, we're so much better than so many percentages of people around us and somehow expect that to impress you. But we thank you, Lord, that Scripture teaches us that when we give our lives to you, that we are hidden in Christ, that what you see is the righteousness and perfection of your Son when you look at us. We've been given the righteousness of Christ and we are justified by His sacrifice on the cross for us. And we thank you, Lord, we don't have to spend our lives trying to build some rickety tower of self-made righteousness trying to build our way to heaven. But instead, Lord, you have dropped this gracious ladder from heaven to us, made by Christ himself as our entryway into even more grace and more love and more mercy. And Lord, we beg you to help us to always remember this and never be in a place, Lord, where we get cocky or we look down on other people even slightly. But Lord, let that refrain echo in our hearts. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Let that be who we are. Let us understand that we are sinners saved by grace. Saved by grace and grace alone. And Lord, we give you the praise for it. Let us be a community that accepts everybody that comes in broken, bruised. Lord, let us be a community that accepts our own brokenness, the brokenness of the people that are part of our church. Lord, we give you the praise that your grace can come in and bring health and healing where there's been brokenness and dysfunction and pain. Lord, may our church, may our church be a a place where lives are turned around by your grace. And with nobody (laughs) tuning away, I just got to say, if you've never given your life to Christ, all you got to say is the same prayer as that tax collector. And it would be my honor to lead you in that prayer if you're ready to give your life to Him. You don't have to get your act together. You can't. You can't get your act together apart from Him. So if you're ready, just pray this prayer with me in your heart. Just say to Him, Jesus, I'm coming to you today to ask you to have mercy on me, a sinner. I thank you for your unlimited grace, your unlimited love, the unlimited sacrifice that you made for me. And I receive all that. I can't earn it. I can't bargain for it. I can't negotiate for it. You're not even asking for that. I just need to receive it. So I receive your love and your grace and your forgiveness. I'm tired of wearing masks and I'm tired of playing games and I'm tired of not being real. I give my very self to you today. Thank you. Thank you for cleansing me. Thank you for making me a Christian. I'll follow you the rest of my life and beyond. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Let everybody please say amen. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer with me, you've made an outstanding decision. All of heaven's erupting. We want to know too. Just text us. Uh, Text the word found to the number on your screen there. We want to pray for you and send you some stuff in the mail. (laughs) I'm proud of you. All right, guys, now's our time of giving. Uh, If you're new to our church, we don't want you to give anything. In fact, we'd like to give you a gift. If you'll text the word NEW to the number on your screen there, we'll send you a gift and uh, email you a gift just to say thanks for being here with us today. We're honored to have you here. Uh, This is just a time for the home folks to worship God with their giving. Um, Let's go ahead and pray over the offering. Lord God, I thank you for those that have given, those that uh, have already given, those that are giving right now. I pray, Lord, you'd bless them. 
And Lord, I thank you, Lord, they're not giving to earn your favor. They're giving because they've been favored. They're not giving to get your blessing. They're giving because they have been blessed. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would bless them. I know that you can't, we can't outgive you. Lord, I know you just love to bless. I pray, Lord, for continued blessing. And uh, Lord, um, do miracles. Do financial miracles in our churches. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Let everybody please say amen. All right, church, I hope that that connected with you. Let me know in the comments if it did. We've got one more week of this series, and I cannot wait for next week. I think it is, well, I don't know if it's the best week, but it's, <laughs> it's up there, okay? But anyway, I love you. Uh, thanks for being here. We're going to close with one more worship song, and we'll see you next Sunday. God bless.